In this presentation, we will talk about learning goals and we will explain the use of taxonomies for writing and reviewing learning objectives. We will define and describe learning goals and try to understand their structure. Additionally, we will learn how to construct a planning chart to make sure that learning goals are aligned with the instruction provided and with the evaluation procedures. We will also discuss the use of taxonomies, specifically Bloom's taxonomy, to write learning goals that target specific cognitive processes. Every educator is familiar with the term learning goals. We also use terms such as objectives, outcomes, targets, and so on. All of these terms refer to the result of classroom experiences. In other words, we refer to what students should know or be able to do as a result of instruction. Learning goals are established based on the state standards, district curriculum guides, or textbooks. In the case of students with special educational needs, goals may be established by the student's IEP team based on the specific needs of that student. All of the sources mentioned before provide teachers with long lists of goals and objectives. Teachers then have to choose the goals and objectives that they think are appropriate for their students. At the beginning of their careers, teachers may wonder which of these goals they should choose from these long lists. Well, first, we have to choose the goals that are essential for our subject area. For instance, in a classroom assessment course, the instructor must discuss the concept of alignment between learning goals and assessment because this is a central issue in educational measurement. Similarly, when teaching math at the elementary school level, we cannot omit important topics such as multiplication or division. Another important criterion in choosing learning goals is the usefulness or applicability of the skills beyond the classroom. For instance, skills such as understanding the main idea of a narrative or writing a letter are essential in daily life. Another criterion to consider is the fact that misconceptions are likely to occur when certain topics are not addressed. For instance, topics related to world geography or health education. And last but not least, it is also important to choose skills and topics that engage students. We can increase student engagement by integrating learning goals across subject areas. For instance, associating a history topic with an art project or a science project with physical activity. Educators should not engage students in activities that do not have a clearly established instructional goal. In fact, every instructional activity should be designed based on the outcome that we want to obtain. The first step is, therefore, formulating the goals. The second step is determining which type of evidence indicates the mastery of that goal. For instance, if the objective is adding numbers up to 100, acceptable evidence would be solving problems that require students to add numbers up to 100. Therefore, instructional activities should focus on teaching students how to solve problems that require addition. When formulating learning goals, it is very important to be aware of their structure. Learning goals consist of two main components, a verb and a noun phrase. The verb is very, very important because it indicates the action that must be taken. In other words, it shows the cognitive skill that is required to complete the task, regardless of the content. For instance, in the example provided, the cognitive skill is using patterns. This cognitive skill is fairly general and, once mastered, can be applied or transferred to a variety of objects and in a variety of subject areas. The second component of a learning objective is the noun phrase. This component indicates the type of knowledge to be learned and is related to the subject area. In this example, we refer to numbers, more specifically to skip counting. This table provides three examples of learning goals. You can see the cognitive skill targeted by each objective, compare, organize, explain, in the verb column, and the content of learning in the noun column. Therefore, when formulating learning goals, we must use action verbs, which indicate an operation that is observable and can be measured. 
For instance, we always want students to understand the content, but if we write a learning goal as understand addition, for instance, this would be too general and too abstract to be accurately measured. We have to be very specific and indicate the observable behaviors that demonstrate understanding, such as solving problems or explaining a solution. Sometimes teachers need to simplify a content standard or an indicator to formulate a learning goal. When doing this, make sure that each learning goal includes only one action and one noun phrase. In other words, break down enumerations to make sure that each skill has its own learning goal. This will be important when we check the mastery of each goal because some of the skills mentioned in the indicator may be mastered and some may not be mastered by students. For instance, some students may have no problem making eye contact but will not have the appropriate posture or gestures when making an oral presentation. Having more than one skill in one objective can be problematic when we design instruction, when we develop assessment tools, when we try to determine students' progress and the effectiveness of the instruction provided. This leads us to the next topic, which is the alignment between learning outcomes, instruction, and assessment. Alignment refers to the degree to which learning objectives, the instruction provided, and assessment target the same content and the same cognitive skills. This may sound complicated, but it's actually very straightforward. We just want to make sure that if we formulate certain objectives, we provide instruction that actually helps students achieve those objectives, and we want to design assessments that measure those objectives and not something else. For instance, if we want students to be able to write a letter, having them just read sample letters and answer comprehension questions will not be sufficient. Similarly, an our project about the Revolutionary War does not demonstrate sufficient historical knowledge about the event. So the alignment between tasks and objectives refers to both the content learned and the cognitive skills. To make sure that objectives, instruction, and assessment are aligned, teachers can use planning charts like the one presented on the previous slide. These tables help educators outline the activities that would be appropriate for teaching each learning objective and the assessments that would provide adequate evidence of mastery. They are really effective tools for ensuring alignment of goals, instruction, and assessment. For instance, if we want students to be able to write for a specific audience, we can teach them how to write thank you notes. We would discuss the different parts of a letter and have them practice with the group or independently by writing a variety of thank you notes for different people. After completing these instruction activities, we can assess the mastery of this objective by asking students about the parts of a letter and having them independently write a new thank you note. Note that the activities in the teaching methods column both follow from the learning goal and prepare students for assessment tasks that relate to the learning goal. Misalignment is the lack of congruence between learning objectives, instructional experiences, and assessment. As mentioned before, misalignment can occur both in the content addressed as well as in the difficulty level or the type of cognitive processing required for completing a task. For instance, if the objective is to add numbers up to 100, having students count groups of objects on a table would not be appropriate evidence of mastery because mere counting is a lower level cognitive skill than adding. Similarly, assessments should not require additional or different knowledge than what was specified in the learning objective and what was taught in the classroom. As I mentioned before, the verb used to formulate a learning goal indicates the type of cognitive processing that is required to master that goal. Besides teaching the content, teachers also have the responsibility of teaching students how to think, how to complete different types of tasks. We aim to help students develop a wide variety of skills, and we also aim to help them develop more and more complex cognitive skills. Once acquired, these types of skills can then be transferred to other content and can be applied independently, thus helping students develop their cognition and become independent learners. There are a variety of cognitive skills. 
Some are fairly simple, while others are more complex, and based on the nature of the operations required and the level of complexity, they can be grouped into different categories. The different types of cognitive skills are organized using taxonomies, which are frameworks or classification systems. A taxonomy that is very frequently used in education is Bloom's taxonomy, which groups cognitive skills based on the type of cognitive processing and, later, in a revised version, based on the type of knowledge used to complete the task. In the following section, we will discuss and explain Bloom's taxonomy, which is most frequently used to formulate and evaluate learning objectives. Bloom's taxonomy is very helpful for differentiating different types of cognitive processing. The most basic level is the knowledge level, in which individuals do not necessarily process or work with the information, but simply recognize, remember, repeat, or state information which does not necessarily demonstrate that they also understand it. For instance, reciting a poem is based on mere memorization and does not constitute evidence of comprehension. As indicated in the second row, learning goals at the knowledge level have verbs such as state, define, select, and so on. Although such goals may be necessary, sometimes they are not sufficient to advance student learning. The next cognitive level is comprehension, when students demonstrate understanding of the content learned. Understanding occurs when individuals grasp the meaning and implications of the content and are able to transform the information without altering its meaning. Understanding can be demonstrated through actions such as conclude, explain, summarize, transform, and so on. Synthesis is a more complex level of processing where individuals can create a new structure by combining information from different sources or identifying new relationships between constructs. For instance, after reviewing a series of recent events involving racial conflicts, students may write an essay about the impact of racial views on our society. This is not a simple summary of events. It requires a deep understanding of the underlying factors that lead to racial conflicts and formulating a hypothesis about the relationships between these events and the changes that occur in our society. You may notice that the other levels, such as knowledge, comprehension, and analysis, are also involved here. They are subordinated to the higher levels. We cannot propose new relationships without knowing and understanding the facts and being able to analyze them. But at the synthesis level, there is something in addition to that. A new structure is created or proposed. The evaluation level is also fairly complex because it involves understanding of a concept in relation with other concepts and the ability to appraise value or use logical reasoning to reach a conclusion or to formulate an argument. The revised Bloom's taxonomy includes some additional information. It includes, in addition to categories of cognitive processing, different types of knowledge. Also, the terminology used for the different types of cognitive processes is slightly different. With the revised taxonomy, we have six levels of cognitive processing, ordered from simple to complex. Remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. These are very similar to the original taxonomy. The only differences are that the knowledge category is now labeled remember and the synthesis category was replaced with create. However, the revised taxonomy introduced a new dimension which is the type of knowledge that individuals work with, factual, conceptual, procedural, or metacognitive knowledge. Procedural knowledge refers to skills or methods, techniques for completing a task. These can be simple or complex and can vary greatly across subject areas, typing, playing an instrument, acting, applying the procedure for solving an equation, and so on. Educators must be very careful because not always applying a procedure demonstrates understanding the content. Only when the procedure is an objective in and of itself can be used as an indicator of mastery like drawing a portrait or climbing a rope or pronouncing a word correctly. 
I would like to also discuss the distinction between factual knowledge and conceptual knowledge. Factual knowledge refers to information that is concrete and is specific to a certain event, individual, or object. In contrast, a concept is stripped of the individual variations and is defined by abstract characteristics, which are the essential or the defining characteristics of an entire group of objects, individuals, or events. For instance, a description of a specific animal that students observed at the local zoo consists of factual knowledge, whereas describing the defining characteristics of mammals requires conceptual knowledge because it consists only of the defining characteristics of an entire category of animals beyond the individual variations. Similarly, describing different wars that took place throughout history requires factual knowledge, whereas the definition of war is conceptual knowledge because students must see the common elements across all of these events and be able to define war in general, not just describe a particular historical event. Another example, asking students to describe the civil war requires factual knowledge, whereas explaining the difference between wars and revolutions requires conceptual knowledge. To complete this task, students must understand and distinguish the defining characteristics of wars and revolutions in general. In conclusion, factual knowledge refers to basic information specific to a discipline, whereas conceptual knowledge is abstract in general and implies relationships. Metacognitive knowledge refers to the individual's awareness of his or her own cognitive processing and awareness of one's own knowledge what one does and doesn't know, and one's ability to understand, control, and manipulate one's cognitive processes. This type of knowledge is targeted, for instance, when working with students on problem-solving skills or study skills, when they learn to detect obstacles and to employ strategies to overcome them. Examples of metacognitive activities include planning how to approach a learning task, using appropriate skills and strategies to solve a problem, monitoring one's own comprehension of a text, self-assessing and self-correcting in response to self-assessment, evaluating progress toward the completion of a task, and becoming aware of distracting stimuli. This concludes the presentation on learning goals and taxonomies. I hope that the explanations and examples provided were helpful and that you have a good understanding of the concepts presented. Don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions.